Okay, I think we'll get started. Hi and welcome. My name is Melanie Kay. I direct the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative here at Colorado Law. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, this event is in partnership between uh, the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative here at the law school in Silicon Flatirons. Um, and is part of our AI ethics series this year. This is our third event of this series. Um, and we're thrilled to have you all here joining us this evening. Um, so I will do a, a brief introduction of uh, Professor Thiesler, our moderator, um, and she will introduce our speaker tonight. And then I know you're all eager to get started. Associate Professor Casey Thiesler researches and teaches in the areas of technology ethics, internet law and policy, and online communities. She is a fellow with Silicon Flatirons Institute for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship, and also an Atlas Fellow, and holds a courtesy appointment in computer science. Welcome, and thank you for moderating today. Thank you. Uh, this is a really exciting series of speakers uh, that we've had over the course of the year, and I am especially excited to have Dr. Ruban Chowdhury here. So Ruban is one of the leading voices in Responsible AI right now. Uh, she worked on Responsible AI at Accenture, CEO and founder of uh, Parity, and until very recently uh, was the Director of Machine Learning Ethics at Twitter. Uh, and now uh, Dr. Chowdhury continues to work uh, with Parity Consulting and is a responsible AI fellow at the Harvard uh, Berkman Klein Inter Inter Center for Internet and Society. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Chowdhury for our speech today. Thank you. Hey everyone, thank you for the warm introduction, Casey. Um, it's always really exciting to meet people you've only known from Twitter for so many years. <laughs> um, so I think my talk today will be actually have a lot of interest of interest to a lot of the people in this room because it's about the intersection of law, especially privacy law, and technology. And, and one of the ways that I hope that things will be progressing, um, and I'm looking forward to actually in particular to the discussion afterwards given the, the wide range of interests and, and experience that, that, you know, that exists in this crowd right now. Um, and I entitled this The Paradox of Transparency. So as Casey said, um, I used to lead the machine learning ethics transparency and accountability team at Twitter. And yes, like the machine learning ethics part is the part that a lot of people are focused on, and rightfully so. But I also find the T and the A of meta, the transparency and accountability to be very, very interesting as well. In a place where I saw an opportunity to start investing in different and new technologies to enable this kind of accountability and transparency and technology. So I think the thing that makes me a little bit different from a lot of people who work in this field is that I have actually always been an applied person, a product person. My like Google Scholar is pretty abysmal. Um, we were joking about age indexes before, <laughs> but that's because my, what I do is I, I, I'm a data scientist by background. Um, so I love the idea of creating solutions to problems at scale. Um, so one of the things I am fascinated by is this notion of algorithmic transparency. So um, to rewind, what really the main reason we talk about transparency and accountability and explainability is because of GDPR. And it's very interesting because these flags were kind of planted years ago and we all kind of still run around them a bit without good or clear understanding of these terms. So algorithmic transparency started off as a response to this idea of a black box algorithm, which is really fascinating because, you know, we're in a world now where there's this new explosion of AI systems. And if you watched the John Oliver show last night, he did a whole half hour video, <laughs> and he actually talked a lot about black box and the big problem is the black box and explaining it, which I found very fascinating, right? So this lack of understandability of ML AI implementation has led to increasing policy and calls for transparency. And I kind of put quotes around this. What, like, what is transparency? And, and this actually really matters when we talk about compliance, product implementation, um, what it means to build transparency into a platform or a product, right? So what do we mean by understandability? Specifically, by whom and for what purpose? So again, we talk about transparency, accountability, explainability, et cetera. Um, 
in my time at Twitter, I was a control owner for some of our some of our FTC mandates. And it was very, very interesting. And also I was a control owner for what was going to be our DSA work as well. If you're unfamiliar with DSA, it's a Digital Services Act, which applies to very large online platforms, which is actually one of the most ambitious laws pushing for algorithmic transparency, accountability, and explainability. So they say things like understandability and understandable by who, right? So we learned from the early days of privacy law when you know you have to when they write things like end user license agreements, they say, hey, look, it's fully, fully, she has a 30-page document in the legalese. Now everyone is fully, it's fully transparent, totally understandable document. Not really, right? Um, and you know, what do we mean by transparency? So for example, on most social media platforms, transparency ends up being defined as a very long policy document describing things buried in a submenu of a submenu of a submenu that literally nobody nobody will read unless you go to like twitter.com, the website for the company, not the app, and you go into our privacy policy, and then there's like another menu. And then you go into like data. I mean, you're, nobody goes there, but then they're gonna be like, look, hey, so that fulfills our requirement for transparency. Yay, we've unpacked the black box. We've not, right? So we have not done this. So policy defining what transparency is. So gen one policy, and again, this is so interesting in light of literally everything that's been happening the past, I don't know, like 10 minutes, <laughs> it seems like. So transparency defined as algorithmic explainability, i.e. explainable AI. So then all the like super nerdy CS people got like extremely excited, like, woo, now we can research explainability. So Gen 1 was like, okay, well, now we're going to invest in models to explain other models. And this is where like Shapley functions, Lime, like if those terms mean anything to you, then you are actually of a very small percentage of people. Most people like those things don't mean anything to you understandably because they're machine learning models that give you output that's understandable to data scientists. So that does not sound to me like very good explainability because it's just us explaining things to ourselves. Um, but that you know really seemed to take off for a minute. A lot of the Gen 1 startups in responsible AI were actually explainability startups. And guess what? None of them actually went anywhere. And a lot of them had to pivot, like, pivot pretty significantly because what they realized is explainable models didn't actually lead to compliance with policy objectives because policymakers didn't understand what a Shapley function was. So that was not helpful. So Gen 2 was policy-based transparency. So now we're talking a lot more about algorithmic auditing, which is something that gets me very excited. Like I never thought I'd be a person that was like, oh, let's talk about risk and compliance. Audits. But it actually is an incredibly, incredibly exciting time. So Casey knows right before this, I was in Paris and there was this big UNESCO summit on internet for trust. And one of the big things that was announced there is I'm actually one of the auditors working with the European Commission on defining what an algorithmic audit is under the Digital Services Act. So very specifically, it has, it has pretty unprecedented level of reach in the mandate for very large online platforms to be accountable to external parties. Actually, a lot of what this talk is about is how do we get to that point of actual transparency and technical accountability that is meaningful and useful to people, right? So now we have this world of algorithmic audits, plain language explanation, and also open access to model and data. So again, it's not just the Digital Services Act. In the US now we have the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, which is still in bill form and like, in my opinion, may or may not pass, but it's, it is part of this new suite of policy that's saying more than just write us a document and like, for like pinky swear you're not doing bad things. <laughs> um, and, and, we, and we've seen fits and starts. So it hasn't been always great, but these are things we're learning over time because we're forging new grounds and combining technical audits and you know data science work with the language of the law. And again, this is just a really, really fascinating, interesting field to be in now. So, the, so what's the paradox of transparency? So presumably transparency allows for more informed decision-making and more trustworthy assessments of how big impact, right? So, you know, it sounds really great when the Digital Services Act says trusted researchers should have access to internal company data for the purposes of understanding compliance with the law. Sounds really wonderful. 
Um, but then my, like the security half of what I do kicks in and you're like, yeah, you know, not all actors are well-intentioned. There's a reason it's called Cambridge Analytica and not Facebook Analytica. Mm -hmm. And that has been an example I've used quite a bit lately because the number one thing I say when I say, well, who, who should have, like, who is a person that should have access? Who qualifies as an auditor? Because we don't have standards. We don't know what an, also, we don't know what an audit is, right? That's literally one of the things people like myself are tasked to do. We don't know who classifies as an auditor. We don't have auditor training certification. We don't have any of that. So like anybody can be like, I'm an auditor. I don't know. Sure. And then they'll say something like, oh, well, you know, it should be respected institution. Like, oh, you mean like, like Cambridge University, like a researcher at Cambridge University, right? Because again, Cambridge Analytica was a researcher who essentially lied to Facebook about how data was being used. And of course, there is plenty of blame to be put on Facebook, how ad targeting works. Remember at the very core of it, was a researcher who lied about how data was going to be used. So A, not all actors are well-intentioned. There are plenty of signals one can give, such as, you know, being at a respected university. There's also a lot of exclusion in those terms, right? When we talk about auditability by, you know, the global south um, and institutions that aren't necessarily considered to be quote unquote respected, whatever that may mean, that's a subjective term. But then also, the second is that transparency can enable gaming the model to promote misinformation or to limit our ability to moderate content, right? So early days of the internet, um, search engine optimization was a thing um, on you know, search platforms. It actually subverted the usefulness of search engines because you didn't actually get the best information. You just got the best information someone else paid to surface. So you know, we had to introduce, well, companies had to introduce more complex models. So there is sometimes a reason for making models difficult to decipher. And again, you know, this is just to balance this idea of like ooh, openness is always a good thing. It's not always a good thing. And then finally again, more openness while well-intentioned can lead to a less safe environment unless we're all actually being very clear and intentional about it, right? So um, this is all just context to talk about. There are many things we should talk about when we talk about transparency and explainability and we can't be overly naive of what it will bring us. And we may, you know, there may be negative externalities to so simply opening, opening up the algorithm, as Elon likes to say. Um, <laughs> so in 2021, so here's a really good example. In 2021, my team at Twitter launched the first algorithmic bias fund. This is really interesting because it's something that um, I had been had been noodling in my brain since my first DEF CON. Um, if you're unfamiliar, DEF CON's the big hacker conference. It's every August in Las Vegas. And you know, bug bounties are a pretty integral part of as a, you know, security and, and infosec. And in general, the premise kind of is that no matter how big of a team you can hire at a company, it is nearly impossible to think of every single way your system could be hacked or vulnerable. Therefore, you know, there are external people you can pay if they find something wrong with your model. And I really wanted to test that out for algorithmic bias, right? So, you know, I sort of alluded earlier to um, if we kind of, the exclusionary process that is creating, quote, credibility, and I recognize that that exists in all of our institutions, including mine at Twitter, right? So in order to work on my team at Twitter, one generally had a PhD, you know, you could speak English, generally located in the United States. I think, you know, we could have entertained people in uh, the UK and Europe, but it'd be really hard to have, like, Asia-based folks like I used to at Accenture. It just makes time zones really rough. So there's so many barriers to entry for most folks, and frankly, algorithmic biases don't, like, you know, see that you don't have a PhD and then just stop biasing against you, right? So we, we really, I really wanted to play with the idea of trying to integrate bias bounties into a standard risk assessment program. So we launched the first algorithmic bias bounty. Um, and it was really fascinating. So the two things that were really interesting takeaways, one is that some of the, some of the winning submissions were actually no code submissions. So people who just kind of hacked at the model in a way that didn't require code and actually still produced new and novel harms, really interesting. And of course, the things that we did not think of. So biases against veterans was actually one, biases against religious head coverings was another, because you know what, nobody on my team, actually that's not true, I did have a veteran on my team, and he didn't know to test for this. Um, and we didn't have anybody on my team, that's also not true, hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, we had a representative team of both of those, but we didn't think to test for those kinds of biases. Um, and then 
in October of last year, a couple of friends and I established the first nonprofit dedicated to algorithmic bias bounties. So we launched our first competition at Camelus, um, which is an InfoSec conference in DC. And Camelus is really trying to merge the worlds of uh, responsible AI algorithmic ethics with information security. Um, and you know, and our first challenge was interesting. It was very, very, very technical. I will say that's one thing we do want to change for future ones. But you know, so this the pursuing the idea of bias values was something that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, so, but here are a couple of lessons that we learned as it relates to how do you balance transparency and accountability, right? So when we were at, when I was at Twitter and we were going to share our model, we could not share all the data we used to train the model. So this would be in violation of individual rights of privacy and security, and also un undermining the hard work of our colleagues at Twitter. Like they're, they have entire teams dedicated to secure and safe data, people's expectations of how their data would be used. And maybe to like all of us in the room, this idea of a bias bounty, uh, an image cropping model would be really interesting. But to somebody else, they're like, well, I don't like the idea that somebody could be using my data for this reason. I didn't want it to be used for, even if it's being on, shared on a public social media platform. Um, and it's difficult to balance this openness with secure, secure private data and models. Uh, and, but also what we have to think about is how can we meaningfully incorporate feedback and be transparent while also protecting the people whose information we have, right? So again, like if we can't just make publicly available data sets, um, and we ran into this actually with, with the bias bounty for the nonprofit program. So our bounty program was about creating an image, an, auto, an automated image tagging model that was optimized not just for accuracy. Well, it was optimized not just for accuracy, but also for uh, lowest amounts of race, perceived age, and perceived gender bias, and also um, latency, so time to run. Our data set was actually something we built and curated ourselves. Uh, and it was pretty large. Um, it was actually a pretty impressive data set. And overwhelmingly, people asked us, well, are you, can we get access to this data? We have people, grad students asking us if they can use it for their dissertations, et cetera. And our answer was just no, um, because we could not think of a way that it would be irresponsible for us to have a nonprofit dedicated to producing algorithmic bias and then put a data set of faces, gender, race, and age out there for anyone to use for any reason they wanted to. So really, there was no good answer. Um, and I wish there were a better one, right? Because I would love to share this data with bad students, people. I want to believe people when they say, oh, I really want to use this for my dissertation, et cetera. Great. I don't know what else people might use it for, right? So um, algorithmic auditing at Twitter. So what we wanted to do is another, as another example. So we, what we want to do is create an end-to-end monitoring system. And as I mentioned, my interest in bias bounties and this kind of work was to proactively identify and mitigate bias at scale. So specifically, like when we think about the Digital Services Act, as I mentioned, we need to think about requirements to open audits to third party groups. And the big question is how will they access this data? Who are these people? And again, like how do we ensure that our data is being used appropriately and for the right purposes? Um, the other thing that we learned is that data sunsetting, this is one of the tensions we have with existing privacy law and mandates at Twitter, data sunsetting requirements actually meant that some of our data did not exist. So one of the flaws with the, with the DSA that I've been talking to them, talking about with them, is that actually we we're required to delete data after nine months. So for example, when we published our work, um, we published in 2021 uh, about the political amplification in seven out of eight uh, Democrat Western democracies. Um, the, that data was from April to August of 2020. By the time, because publication cycles and reasons, by the time that paper was out and published, that data was going to be gone in about three months because of federally mandated requirements to delete data. So what do we do about this? Like, great, okay, then we carve out an exception. But then everyone wants to carve out. Everyone's data is special to them. Everyone wants to carve out an exception. So let's think about like what, what this means if we're actually going to meaningfully call for audits every year. And that's actually the, that's the, Time frame. They want every algorithmic system and every very large online platform to be audited on an annual basis. Great. How can we ensure that this data is actually still there? As I mentioned, who qualifies as third party auditor? Third, how to protect intellectual property. And the fourth one is really important is what if we don't have the data we need to audit? 
So again, people's expectations of privacy and security, especially of social media platforms, is you don't need to know my gender, my age, my race. You don't need to know these things about me. Um, there's a whole conversation about you know Facebook back when they mandated verification and just didn't work slash was actively harmful to some people. But now we're gonna be required to audit. How do we do this? We can't. So as a really good example, one of the very last papers my team squeaked out the door before we got fired um, <laughs> was an audit of our home timeline algorithmic system based on race. So one of the prevailing hypotheses was that the Twitter home timeline algorithm was biased against black people. So we want to actually test for that, but we don't collect race data, nor should we frankly collect race data on people on our platform. Literally, there's no good reason for us to have it or anybody to have that data. Uh, imputing race is also very problematic for very obvious reasons. I don't think I've felt this room why imputing race is problematic. Um, so the best we could do is aggregate census data at the census tract level and try to map that to expectations of race distribution, which as a social scientist is like the worst way to try to construct a variable because your unit of analysis has now gone from individual to group and that doesn't really make sense. So unsurprisingly, we found no correlation, but we have a very, very long caveat of we understand this is a garbage metric, <laughs> but because we don't have the data. So if we are being asked to audit our models based on let's say human rights impact, which is part of the DSA, uh, how can we do that when we don't, and again, we shouldn't have this data, right? So tensions here, data storage, appropriate use and data collection. Okay, now to a way possibly forward. So privacy enhancing technology. So for some, some of the folks in this room may be familiar with some of them. Uh, differential privacy is a big one. Homomorphic encryption is another. Cryptographic safe rooms is all these technologies that are being invested in that would presumably, if they realize their potential and can work at scale, et cetera, would enable us to both have accountability and transparency as well as privacy and security. So that's like the, the ambition. So last fall at the UN General Assembly, uh, former, well then Prime Minister Hassan Ardern announced the Christchurch Call Initiative for Algorithmic Outcomes. It was actually born out of a project that my team started at Twitter with the nonprofit Open Mind. So before that was fall of last year, the CCIAO, we spent an hour in a room naming this thing and like stress testing it. Like what are all the ways in, like, like all the ways in which someone can make fun of this name? Sure, we spent an hour naming this thing. Um, actually it was born out of a project we started the previous January. We actually saw the blog post about it with a nonprofit open mind. So we wanted to do, so once we published the paper on algorithmic gamification, understandably everyone who studies radicalization online wanted our data, uh, but we could not share that data because it had sensitive information about politicians about media sources, et cetera. And we decided it was a good candidate to prototype privacy enhancing tech. So our very first project, um, which is the first project of the Christchurch Call Initiative was to allow replicability of our findings by enabling external researchers to use a differentially private environment to access our data, to actually replicate the analysis and prove that like we indeed at Twitter are not lying about what we said we did. Um, so similarly, there's actually a competition undergoing right now, and the winner is going to be announced quite soon across the White House and the UK Center for Data Ethics Innovation uh, on the use of PETs for things like healthcare and banking. So the UK challenge is on uh, identifying banking fraud um, using allow allowing third parties to access SWIFT codes and sensitive banking data without again having visibility into that data, which could do a lot for transparency and accountability for the, the uh, financial industry, another industry in which they're literally legally not allowed to collect demographic data, which has always led to issues with algorithmic auditing. Um, so here's the potential, right? So one, as I mentioned, research reproducibility. So you should not believe me because I was employed by Twitter and said that we audited a model and said it was not racist. You should be able to verify that for yourself. That makes a lot of sense. Second is meaningful algorithmic accountability post-deployment. Before this had a fancy name, we, um, Andrew, who was the CEO of OpenMind, he and I used to just call this the Bias Research Network. And our dream was to have a decentralized, differentially private environment of auditors, model owners, data owners, researchers, who could all actually share and access each other's data and models. So it's not just unilateral where, for example, 
my team is sharing Twitter's models. It would also be, for example, the US Census Bureau is part of this network. And now my team is able to get user level race data without actually getting user level race data to proactively audit our own models. So everyone kind of benefits from this, right? So meaningful algorithmic accountability, pre and post deployment. And also the other thing my team was working on, if you remember before everything at Twitter blew up, the previous time everything at Twitter blew up was when Jack Dorsey went in front of Congress and uttered the words algorithmic choice. So I will tell you, no one at Twitter knew he was gonna do this. So he literally just like popped off in front of Congress and said, we're gonna do this algorithmic choice thing. Um, and then my team volunteered to do it for them. Um, so part of that would be enabling developers. So if you're unfamiliar with the term algorithmic choice, Essentially, the way Jack talked about it was it was a third-party app store for algorithms. What he really wanted was for Twitter not to actually own the machine learning models that curated the content that you see, and that presumably you could go to like an app store. I mean, this is an oversimplification, but it, it works. An app store where different groups have made their own custom algorithmic systems, and you could find one that kind of shares your values so if you're familiar with how people have been talking about data brokers for like 15 years at this point, it's like that, but for social media curation. Um, but in order to do that, then third-party developers would have to have access to the same kind of data that people at Twitter had, which they don't, right? So we do have developer API, et cetera. It is very, very limited. So you, you could not enable proper algorithmic choice, i.e. a competitive market, unless everybody had access to all the data at Twitter, which again, back to the whole beginning of this talk, would be in violation of a lot of our privacy and security requirements, right? So PETs could, in, a, in some advanced world, enable that kind of developer access. So why PETs? Um, so it may allow, allow unprecedented access to data without compromising integrity. So there's a couple of things that like very specifically you can do with it that we wanted to test as part of this Christchurch call initiative. So number one, control who is accessing it, which is kind of the obvious one, right? So it, it puts a little walled garden around your data and you can decide who gets in, but also very specifically what they're using it for. So you can actually budget how much compute essentially, like how much time or resources they get. So you can't, it's very different from me sending you a flat file of data and I can't, I, once you have the data, it literally is out of my hands. It's untrue, you have a data budget. So let's say you have a general idea of how much it quote costs to audit a model, you give everybody that budget, then presumably they use it appropriately. And if they go, if they need to grow over, at least they have to justify to you why they need continued access. Um, no locally available data, the obvious reason to do it, only output. Uh, the third that's, so the, as, as I mentioned, metering the use of budget. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting about it is you actually can get output verifiability. In other words, as the owner of the data, you essentially get receipts, <laughs> the best way to put it. So you know what it was the person was doing with that data. Again, something you can't do if I'm just sending you a flat file. Um, and then ultimately you can connect data sources with model owners. So people can actually link across multiple nodes. Um, and again, in this sort of imaginary bias research network that Andrew and I continue to fantasize about, different people are sharing different things and everyone's accessing what everybody else has. And what's great is you only actually have to match at the user level once before you're able to kind of connect through the whole network. So what I mean specifically is, let's say like my email address is also my email address in the US Census Bureau, which is also my email address for another, like, you know, some research study that I've agreed to sign up for. Now that researcher can access my census data and my Twitter information for their research project without actually seeing any of that data. So it really improves the robustness of every actor here. So again, this is like, I'm dreaming right now, right? <laughs> so move slow and think of things. PETs are a very early technology. So um, I think, so one of the questions I get asked, and maybe someone in this room has thought of it, and it's a very good question is, didn't Facebook try to do this with social science one? Wasn't that a colossal failure? Yes and yes. Uh, so one of the things I was tasked to do before Twitter put a pile of money into this was to say, to do a bit of a postmortem on what went wrong with social science one. And, you know, Fortunately, there were people at Twitter at the time who had actually worked on social science ones and talked to a lot of folks. So this is sort of my take. Maybe I'm, you know, I was not there. Maybe I'm wrong about parts of it. But my understanding is there were two things that went wrong. Number one is the technology was too early. 
Um, and it's still very early, but this was even earlier. So one, the technology was still more in R&D than it is now. And number two was like, there was not clearly managed expectations. So it was very like, we're gonna overpromise, and then it ends up kind of under delivering. Um, and we were very careful not to repeat that. So what I did with Andrew is we sat and we actually mapped out what are the, so what is the purpose of this Christchurch call initiative? Actually, it is not, yes, it is to, you know, make models transparent. Very specifically, if you're familiar with the remit of the Christchurch call, it's to identify radicalizing content, right? So it's born out of the Christchurch call massacre that happens. And the whole point is to uh, mitigate uh, online violence and radicalization. So under that remit, it's about understanding the, or understanding the potential of certain algorithmic systems for promoting radicalizing content. So that's fine. Um, but what are the big questions we have to answer about PETs in order to see if the technology works at scale? Because that's really the, the meta problem we're trying to solve here, right? Um, so I, we want to be able to prove that PETs can work at scale for algorithmic auditing. So what are the different milestones we have to meet? So one is um, how much data can PETs handle? And actually, that was the question we were answering with the 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 Twitter, uh, the Twitter example. So we wanted to test if PETs would work for a billion lines of data, which hadn't happened before. And it does. So great. Like now we've tested it in terms of size. So two was a pure security question, right? How might a PETs environment be subverted? One of the things we want to do is actually have a capture the flag. If you're familiar with what a capture the flag is, uh, like a capture. So essentially like we'll give you a system and like try to break it. Um, like hack this system. So how might a PET's environment be subverted? And you have to define hacks. So one would be, even though you don't have access to user data, they're able to figure out who someone is, for example, or whatever, like things you wouldn't want them to know. So number one, number two is figure out all the different security threats. Number three is test complexity of user query. Um, so, you know, what, what, like how difficult of a question can you ask um, of your PET's environment? Uh, another one was actually how complex your data can be. So we wanted to work with video data, for example, as opposed to numerical data or text data. Five is how, like, what is a trusted network? So like, you know, whenever we're saying trust in anything, things get very dicey and potentially exclusionary. So who is allowed? How do we figure out who's allowed in a trusted network? And then the last one was output verifiability, this idea of like receipts. Like I know what people did with this data. So we actually outlined the different questions we wanted each of our challenges to answer. And again, in some sort of like alternate dimension where Elon Musk didn't take over Twitter, this talk would be about how we're like starting to reach all the milestones in doing all of this. So we're not, we're like sort of sure number one's gonna happen maybe, but given this latest round of layoffs of the weekend, I don't know if like anyone's home anymore. So we'll see. <laughs> um, so what's next, right? PETs will be a major topic of discussion in the very, very near future. So as I mentioned, like not just Twitter, not just this, the, the initiative, um, there are other companies and so Microsoft was actually a member of the initiative as well. And, you know, we we're working with a team at LinkedIn to be able to test another one of the open questions on PETs. The DSA is kind of pushing all of this forward even further, Platform Accountability and Transparency Act are pretty much saying, we need platforms to open data for testing. What does it mean to open data? How can we make it secure, et cetera? Um, and also the, so keep an eye on the pets challenge that's been launched by the CDEI and the White House. So at the Summit for Democracy, which is I think in May, it's quite soon. That's actually when they'll be announcing the winners of the pets challenges in the US. So it's actually a really, really big deal because again, the, the case studies that they built for those challenges are very, very tangible real world case studies, not just around online platforms, but as I mentioned around healthcare, around banking, other industries in which we actually do need that level of algorithmic transparency and auditability, but we have very, very clear laws protecting how data is being used. So as I mentioned, still open questions to solve. The problem is the laboratory R&D has been done, right? So very, very smart people have been working on PETs for a very long time. All the ways in which it can be tested in a laboratory are pretty much exhausted. What is really needed are real world examples, big companies with massive amounts of data, complex data, people asking tough questions. Um, and that's really the thing that I hope we invest in. Um, and, you know, kind of, as I mentioned, the thing that I'm, I still remain passionate about, even if I'm not on Twitter anymore. So I think that's it for slides.
That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm glad you mentioned social science one because that's what I was thinking too. I'm so. sure. I'm sure. I didn't think I looked right at you when I said it because it was uh, such a disappointment to so many social scientists who really, really, really wanted to use it. Can you all hear us okay? Mm -hmm. oh, How's yours? No. Hello. Yeah, yeah, it's on. Is mine okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so I actually want to start um, by asking you about one of my uh, favorite audits at Twitter, which was the image cropping yes. algorithm. Um, so for, for those of you who might not have heard about this, um, it started with some sort of casual user audits. And in particular, I'm remembering the image that had, it was a vertical image with Mitch McConnell and Barack Obama. And so someone took this, took this image, put one at the top and one at the bottom, and the other one at the top and the other one at the bottom, and both times it cropped to Mitch's face. Um, and so that started conversation about um, digital bias and image cropping mm -hmm. algorithm. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how uh, that led to Twitter's um, audit, how that went. And in addition, like this was not necessarily a typical reaction from a company like, oh, some, you know, our users found some bias. Let's, let's check it out ourselves. Let's see. <laughs> um, and so how do you think we can encourage more of that too? Yeah. So interestingly, so I love that example because it, so that whole situation went down when I was actually interviewing with Twitter. And it was actually it was one of the ways in which I was really trying to decide between do I leave the startup or maybe it stop if you ever built a company, you know, and it's doing well, and you're like, ah, why do I want to leave? But you know, Twitter and so the ability of impact is massive. And I, I it was actually one of my litmus tests for if I wanted to be in the company. And I was really impressed by a couple of things, even before before the audit, right? So um, it actually the original example was um, somebody was talk, took a screenshot of them talking to their friend on Zoom. This man was white, his colleague was black. And when he was trying to post it, it kept cropping his friend out. Um, and then that led to the Mitch McConnell. So then, you know, sort of the citizen data sign up. So there's a lot of things about, you know, Twitter that actually were very beautiful. And one is it's like the citizen data science, right? And so the whole like test set, uh, so people started building entire test sets. So it started off with the, the Mitch McConnell, Barack Obama one. Somebody actually even made an entire Simpsons test set. So basically people just started making libraries of images and throwing them up on Twitter to kind of see how the cropping model would work. It was really beautiful. The thing I really loved was uh, our design lead at the time, Dantley, Dantley Davis, and Prague, who was our CTO, later became CEO, actually kind of hopped in on the conversation. They're like, cool, like, can you explain what's happening? And at that time, there had never been that level of engagement by C-suite or like leadership at a company actually listening to people rather than trying to like hide behind legalese and policy people or like, you know, nice talking points and sort of shutting it down. So it was one of the first times we saw that level of transparency um, by core leadership. And they pretty much said it, and they were a whole, this is, again, before I even started, this predates me, saying, well, we're going to look at this, we're going to do something about it, right? So when I come in, this is when we conduct the audit, and we have an entire blog post of like our methodology and our findings, et cetera. And the hardest part, frankly, I think it took me like a week to literally write that blog post. No, well, because it's very hard to put, to explain a technical audit well, but clearly, right? So to have that right balance between explaining literally what you did without going over people's heads. So uh, what we did find was there was some preference for lighter skin and for women, which is really interesting because when we hosted the the bias of the challenge, our winner actually essentially created a filter, like a, like a filter to make images lighter and more feminine and younger. <laughs> so it's so basically like TikTok or Instagram. <laughs> is what they made. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, was, it was a very fascinating exercise. And frankly, it was the citizen data science that really made me want to do the bias study. Because essentially, we do this labor for free for companies, right? And at some point tonight, we're gonna to have to talk about chat. We're gonna talk about generative AI because, like, that's all we're allowed to talk about now. <laughs> we can't open the words AI with the word, without the word generative being in front of it. But one of the biggest things is this negative externality is often pushed on the public. Like, while it is beautiful that citizen data science is real, it's also not how things should be. 
which is why I wanted to introduce the idea of a bounty program so people could actually be paid for finding bad things and not just have to do it in this spare time. Do you think there are incentives for companies to actually do that though? Or what could they be? Yeah, so are there incentives? Um, I think, okay, if there's one, there, one really positive thing that actually came out of the bounty program was the fact that we got overwhelmingly positive requests. One of the big concerns at most companies, because I've had this idea in my head for years, I have never been in a situation where I could actually execute on it, right? I think there was no way they were gonna do that. Like it's just, there's no way. And usually they'll say, oh, well, we're gonna get blowback and everyone's gonna be mad, they're gonna find the harms, they're gonna forget that like, da, da, da. And actually overwhelmingly, the, the press was 98% positive about it, um, which is like pretty unprecedented for like a product launch or anything like that. So I hope that the fact that Twitter came out looking good because we were honest, could spark other companies to want to be more honest and open in what they build, although who knows anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, actually, one of the worries that I've had both, you know, with respect to things like Cambridge Analytica or what happened with, with Social Science One, um, or really any sort of uh, research ethics scandal in the tech industry, um, is that we start to see uh, this pushback against, against research. And so you talked a little bit about the trade-offs between um, privacy and releasing data so that we can do audits and those sorts of things. You mentioned how um, uh, this is coming up with the DSA um, in terms of requirements uh, for companies of certain size platforms to release data to external researchers. Um, so I'm, just, I'm wondering if you want to reflect a little bit more on um, what we can best do to mitigate harms, and um, particularly if we are in kind of, as you say, like an early stage in terms of the privacy enhancing technology, are there other ways that you think uh, we can uh, do this kind of work without potentially harming users, um, also in ways that aren't going to make companies totally bulk? <laughs> right, right. No, that's a great question. So there is some precedent for this kind of thing in a very analog fashion, right? So in if you work in a field where data is already very protected, um, sometimes, for example, you'll have clean rooms and you have to go, let's say, to the NIH and you access data from a very protected environment. It actually is what social science one ended up being, right? Ended up being like secure laptops being sent to people. Um, so there are there are ways. It doesn't have to be this like very you know PET enabled environment, although that would actually be a much cheaper environment than like having people physically fly somewhere and access data. So that might be one way to think through to think about it. The thing I actually worry about the most is like I said, like what defines what an audit is and who an auditor is. I think those things kind of worry me the most because I see both sides. One is, you know, you want to be open and inclusive, especially if we want to think about at scale harms. The Digital Services Act is meant to be far reaching just like the GDPR was. And there are actually protections against fundamental human rights. So that's really great. But then if you then limit to quote trusted or accredited organizations, whatever that means, that ends up being quite exclusionary. On the other end, correct, you shouldn't let just anybody have access to all the data at companies. So you know, these are the problems we're going to have to be tackled. I'm glad we're tackling them, but um, it's a pretty stressful time for all the folks at the, at the, at the EU right now. Um, and you know, along these lines of like uh, research access uh, or really any kind of access, uh, what do you think of Twitter shutting down free API access? Do you think that's going to have a negative impact on um, auditing or other types of research? Yeah, it's it's really disheartening to see that being shut down. I think what it really does bring to mind and really put to the forefront is if these platforms really are the arbiters of democracy why are they privately owned? Because this is what happens, right? At the whims. So like, he is allowed to do what he's doing. You may think it is morally abhorrent or wrong, but he is well within his right to do this because he owns this company as his data. So he's actually just allowed to do this. So the problem is that he is allowed to do this, not that he has done it in a sense, right? Because if anyone's allowed to do what they want with the things they privately own. Now, if the thing they privately own dictates the course of democracy, that's that's actually what the problem is here. Um, but yeah, so it, it's been pretty devastating for 
um, third-party platforms. So I'm an investor in a company called Block Party, which creates tools for people who get traditionally very harassed online, above and beyond blocking, muting, et cetera. Um, and Tracy's like, she has a startup that's very, that actually was very successful. And you know, she's definitely afraid of this API being shut down um, because her company may not be able to encode the will, it will be very difficult for them to figure out how they're going to continue providing the services they're, that they're providing. Um, and you know, we've seen a lot of research organizations, um, a lot of researchers who have built amazing bodies of work doing audit work um, who don't know how their research is going to progress. Um, so since you mentioned private, private ownership of platforms and data, uh, do you have any thoughts on federated social media <laughs> that you would like to share? Uh, just a sort of general question in the context of the kinds of things that you've been talking about, uh, privacy, data ownership, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, it's, so one of the things that was the most of, uh, my background, I'm a social scientist, so I make everything into like this fascinating study of human beings and ethnography, right? So the most interesting thing that happened when all of us like moved or attempted to move to Mastodon from Twitter is we were so indoctrinated into this very centralized, commercialized model of social media we didn't know what to do. It's like, it's, like we for, it's like the pandemic and we all forgot how to like, we like we forgot how to be social creatures. And it was actually kind of horrifying to see all of us move from Twitter and go to Mass and start yelling at everybody. And then the people who had been on Mass are like, people are really rude. So, right? so you know, like, we're so used to like punching up to the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Jack Dorseys of the world that we forgot that the people who run Mastodon instances are literally just regular people who like nerded out about a hobby and wanted to make a place for their friends to chat. And now we're all in there like, accommodate all million of us. What do you mean? You don't have time to create content moderation. They're like, I have a day job. And we're like, what? So it's, it's, just, it's interesting because in a sense we are like jokes aside, it's interesting because we have been rendered very incapable because these very, very wealthy people who run these very uh, money heavy, I was gonna say profitable, but it's not about profit, just like money flush companies actually did spend a lot of money on trust and safety, content moderation, ethics, et cetera, even if it wasn't sufficient. And then we went to an environment where it was just regular people and there's literally zero dollars being spent on it. And we walk in with this expectation of being catered to and that we haven't figured out is what does this mean when it's literally like literally a person who's just like, I don't know, an office manager by day who happens to have run a mass on instance that's just wildly popular. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'm, I would be honest to say like, we didn't always behave ourselves and we were always very kind to these people whose houses we were in. You know, it's like we, like we went to someone else's house and complained about the food is a little bit how it felt. <laughs> the other thing that was really interesting is for all of our complaints about algorithmic systems, we all went to mass on and got very, very upset that we couldn't go viral anymore. People got <laughs> real mad about that <laughs> and continue to be real mad about that. I constantly see those, like, this, this resurgence every once in a while of like, oh, we should create uh, another layer on top of Mastodon so we can have algorithmic curation. And I'm like, but I thought that was a problem, guys. Um, I think I think there's some, some research that shows that people say they just want, you know, a chronological news feed, but then they don't like it. Well, so like my like very unscientific study, I think I did, I actually asked people this on Twitter once, a very unscientific study. What I found is actually what most people used was not reverse cron, they used lists. So what they actually did was they grouped people into similar interests, and that's how they liked looking at Twitter, um, which sort of is reflected in the structure of Massa, but not really. You'd have to have different Massa instances. You'd have to have an account with different Massa instances all built around a particular thing. But I also think we were very nuanced. So for us in Responsible AI, Someone I was talking to was like, oh, well, I have a list for the people who do like law and ethics, another one for like computer science and ethics, and ones who do recommenders, you know. So we have our own ways of curating lists. So actually, I think the people who I knew, and, my, and again, my very unscientific poll that didn't quote like algorithmic curation were more the people who made lists rather than say like, I prefer 
encourage reverse crowd. Well, that's interesting. You're like, what do I feel like? What do I want to see right now? Yeah, yeah. Dogs or yeah. rage or politics or whatever. <laughs> Actually, really interesting. So as I mentioned, my team was, um, we were building what Alibi the Choice was. And we had hired um, Dr. Sarah Roberts, if you're familiar with her. She's the one who wrote um, behind the screen, like the book on content moderation before content moderation was cool. <laughs> um, and we hired her as, a, as, one, as our first, and our only uh, academic in residence to help us start to tackle what algorithmic choice is. And one of the things we were uncovering was, you know, people did want more ownership, but actually it wasn't about having a sophisticated algorithm curation. They just wanted more user experience tools that where they could own their experience. And that was one of it. So like being able to flip through different, essentially tabs of preferences was one of the ones that came up quite a bit in the work that we did. You know, since you mentioned content moderation, um, another common uh, transparency trade-off is, um, well, if you tell people more about how the system works, they're gonna be able to take advantage of it. Um, like a really simple example of this I always think of is like, the auto mod on Reddit has like, you know, block lists of words, but you can't tell people what words they're not allowed to say because then they'll just, you know, yeah. spell them differently or, or whatever. Um, uh, do you think that that is, uh, is a problem? And if so, like, are there ways to mitigate it? That's a great question. Um, is it a problem? Absolutely. Um, and this, you know, I, I sort of alluded to it earlier with increased transparency and you have to worry about people trying to game your system or subvert your IP, like I said, with search engines, it literally subverted the purpose of search engines because people were just paying money to have their content pushed up top. Um, and unfortunately, the answer to that traditionally has been, let's just make things more opaque or more complex. Like you said, like they have to have a list of block words, but they can't share what the list of block words is, which also then makes it harder for, let's say, people of other communities who are maybe trying to get words added to block lists to understand what the standard is for something we include on a blog list. Again, if those things are not being made transparent, um, I don't know what a good answer is. But honestly, it's like asking the answer to like content yeah. moderation. There is no answer to content Solve moderation. Solve content moderation. Now. <laughs> 30 seconds ago, all of it. Um, so, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna ask one more question before opening it up to everyone else and, so that I can um, ask a question that, that mentions generative AI. Um, uh, so uh, beyond privacy, um, what are some other ways that you think regulation needs to catch up to AI? Like, and, and again, you know, all that anyone can talk about right now is generative AI. Right. Um, so what other, other kinds of issues do you think we're gonna see? Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually independent of generative AI. I think the big thing, so I mentioned earlier that I was a control owner uh, for some of the FTC stuff and also was a control owner for DSA work. One thing I realized, because I'd never been in that position before, is that often control owners are policy people and legal people. So I guess if there are folks who don't know what a control owner is, probably do. Sorry if I'm like lecturing people who like know the separating. I didn't know what a control owner was, that's what I'm saying. Um, but essentially if there's a mandate to comply with something, somebody is at the company is the, oh, the control owner as in the person essentially responsible for implementing, to, for ensuring that you are compliant with that aspect of the law. So I was the control owner for things like algorithm economy, et cetera. But traditionally those go to like legal and policy folks. And then the, like, the engineers are very, very removed from this. In other words, they get kind of dragged into a couple of meetings where like a legal person talks at them for a bit about their job and how, it, how they're gonna make it compliant. And then maybe ask them to like read a document. But like from an engineering perspective, like first of all, you don't understand what this law is most of the time. And you know, because you're like dumb or whatever, it's written in another language for you. And then you have to translate your work into this thing that you never have thought about before. And it's quite hard, right? So I was, I actually wanted to be the control owner and they were perplexed. Like, why don't you <laughs> want to do this? I'm like, because it's important. Um, but I, I think one of the things that, and it may actually end up getting put into best practices for DSA auditing is to, and actually for other clients I'm working with, um, to mandate technical control owners. I think that's actually really critical. So bringing, so we've talked a lot, and I know you've done a lot of work on education, right? So like you're in these schools teaching computer scientists 
about ethics, right? One of the ways in which they can actually practice it is if their managers are actually pulled into some of these compliance audits and not from a like, hey, can you like double check this document from me perspective, but like from actually like explain to the people at the DSA how your algorithmic system works. So I think that like that to me is one of those really critical moments where we're combining these two worlds of technology and, and, and law and policy in a very meaningful way. And like we, we've all been talking about like interdisciplinary blah, blah, blah for a very long time, but like we haven't seen it enacted in policy quite yet. So I'd be, I'm really enthusiastic about that kind of thing. So it's like a very tangible thing I think legal and policy entities can do to start bridging that gap is just reducing the number of layers between the auditor and the external audit body with the actual people who own and build the models. So the computer science students should take my class. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> For many reasons. And we managed to get this whole thing without talking about chat GPT. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we still have half an hour. It's um, we can't be as chat GPT. <laughs> Um, and also, if you all didn't hear, there's going to be a conference about generative AI here at Silicon Flatiron. It's on April the 21st, she says with Ann Harry. Um, uh, so I don't know if there's someone whose job it is to run the mic. Um, if not, I can. <laughs> but do we have any uh, questions from folks? All right, I will, I will run the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. <laughs> So at the beginning, you were talking about you know, transparency as sort of a, you know, let's let the machine learning engineers do a better job, right? And then you were talking about transparency as let's make it possible to audit, you know, these systems kind of at the large scale. So I'm wondering if the, the kinds of technologies you're talking about actually will do anything for kind of end user sort of transparency. Am I going to understand my results from the system yeah. better? Um, or is that a completely different problem? Short answer, completely different problem, but also a very, very important problem. I think ultimately the hardest thing to do, I think I said it earlier about how it took me so long to write that one blog post, is really just explain this. People are really smart, and they're often smarter than they are talked at by companies. And to, to actually explain how these technologies are used so they can make informed decisions is a really, really difficult thing to do. So I was joking earlier about how policy documents get buried, et cetera, but there is a role and a purpose for policy documents um, if done meaningfully. I think the ones that people tend to like the most is actually from Facebook, like the, why am I seeing this ad thing, actually ended up being quite enlightening for people in a way that, you know, like whether they wanted to or not, they actually created a really smart way of explaining things to people. So I, I'm not a UI UX person, but I'm sure very, very smart people have started to think about this, like I hope they have, because um, that's something I'd like to see as well, because you're right, we still haven't moved beyond, we moved from like one elite tier of society to another elite tier of society, yay, uh, but how do we get it to regular people who are on social media platforms? Thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it um, and also laughed a bunch, which is also nice. Um, uh, my question is, what is your opinion or um, thoughts about the relationship between open science and, P and pets? Um, because, clear, I mean, there's some funding agencies that require open science, for example, and so I'm required to go make sure that all my data is open. And um, I'm just curious what you think about that, because it's, it kind of sounds like pets challenges that notion or would maybe even replace it. Um, that's a great question. I think the one difference would be open science wants you to put your data out there, not just so that people can access it for reasons you approve, but that they can access it to do their own new and novel research. So it's essentially like, so with pets, like while it isn't a centralizing body, there is still an approving body. So if I'm the US Census Bureau and I'm in this like bias research network, I still have to actually approve the requests that come my way and approve that budget, et cetera. So I don't, I don't think it would replace it because you as a researcher, like that's an onerous amount of work to dump on you to say, oh, you know, you've done this research. Now every single time someone wants to access it, they have to now get approval from you and blah, blah, blah. Like it's 
unreasonable. So I think it just plays a slightly different role. It's what it's similar to how if you're let's say you were doing your studies on healthcare and you need to access NIH data, you would have to like go to NIH and you know do this research there. So it would replace the the sensitive data access part of things. Um, but I think open science. I mean, open science really is the reason why AI, machine learning, and data science has, has become as big as it has so quickly. It's that everything was freely available. Um, and one of the things we are battling now is actually the culture of data science as it relates. And now I'm going to bring in generative AI, right? <laughs> because so much of generative AI is about building on what's freely out there in the world and us now saying it's unfair for you to extract from the commons and make a private good. Um, but the entire field of data science is built on that. We used to teach data science, and we taught it as, you know, you know, you you can scrape off the internet using beautiful soup, and it's fine because that's just what the internet's for is for scraping stuff. So, slightly different answer to your question, but ultimately, I don't think PETS is meant to replace it. I think it's meant to to augment it, um, and frankly, allow better access to data that traditionally you would not be able to make open. Again, love, that was absolutely awesome. Thank you very much for that. Um, what would you say, this may be more a life question, but when you were in school, what did you think you were gonna be doing? Did you think you'd be working for Twitter doing this? Or <laughs> what, and what, what has allowed you to find success in your life the way you have? Uh, what a great question, man. Uh, so short answer is no, um, because I am old enough to not trust big institutions. Um, so I didn't ever think I'd work for a very big company. So most people don't know that I'm a political scientist by background. When I graduated, I worked for like nonprofits and public policy works for a long time. And I had zero interest in working for big companies. It's actually really funny that I ended up here. So no, it, at no point did I ever think I was going to work at I, like A, Accenture, like literally the definition of a big basis organization, or B, Twitter, like never could I possibly have thought this. Um, and these fields didn't exist. Um, data science didn't exist. AI didn't exist. And definitely responsible AI didn't exist. So there's no way in predicting it. Uh, I would say the only thing I've ever done is do things that I found interesting and rewarding. Um, and pretty much the rest of it, it's such a corny answer. But it's really <laughs> true. Love it, yeah. <laughs> it is a very corny answer, though. But it really, like, I just want to see, but I can't do something if I don't enjoy it and if I do enjoy it it doesn't feel like work um and it I think it really does come across when no matter what you do for a living if you enjoy it it's just so obvious when other people interact with you awesome thank you Um, I was wondering, so the level of integration that we have with like social media nowadays, since so many people are on social media, um, starting at like a young age, and I know that a lot of social media sites do have, you know, age restrictions that aren't necessarily often respected by users. Um, but does that level of like integration and interaction with algorithms make it, do you think, easier or harder for those algorithms to be, you know, um, tailored to, you know, transparency or, you know, uh, ensuring that those algorithms can be tailored to users. So it's a question more about, like, essentially young people on algorithm, uh, on social media platforms, or? I think, like, both, like, young users as they both grow or ensuring the safety of young users as well. Yeah, so to the safety of young users, that's actually very specifically with the UK online safety bill is targeting, so there's you know, there is sort of the impact of algorithmic systems at large, and then there's in particular the impact of algorithmic systems as it relates to protected classes, which is I, which I found to be very interesting in terms of like a legal foothold into regulating and auditing algorithmic systems. So in the UK, the online safety bill specifically talks about the protection of you know protected classes, including children. So what's fascinating is it kind of gives more of a hook for lawmakers to say, okay, well, in particular, you are responsible for your impacts on young people, 
not just for the obvious stuff like you know um, not exposing them to like predators, but also for things like mental health. So I think that's really interesting. So your second, so the other part that you were saying, like kind of with them as they grow, and maybe this wasn't the intention of your question, but I wrote this paper um, a while ago about something that again, it's like if I was were a researcher and I'm a product person, there's so many different things I would say. This would have been one of them. Um, I like have this existential worry about algorithmic systems and essentially free will, right? So algorithmic systems are based on historical data. So like your Netflix, Spotify, whatever. So the core assumption is that whoever you are is whoever you will continue to be forever. And not just, so any, any recommendation you're given is a function of your past. Um, and the other part is if you're exploring new things, it's viewed as an outlier. So we wrote this paper and we called it a barriers to exit. So essentially it, there isn't really a way to explore new stuff because the, uh, the algorithmic system very aggressively like shoves you back to your functional form. It's like, no, 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 you like terrible romantic comedies. Like what are you doing <laughs> watching art house films, right? And, and you know, as it kind of relates like young people growing up, your preferences change over time, at least they should change over time when you're growing up. Um, and I don't know what it means for algorithmic systems to like still think that, you know, you like the Disney Channel, I, mean, I like the Disney Channel. So like <laughs> bad example, but you know, like that, that you still like the things you liked when you were 15 or 16. Um, I don't think there's been sufficient research done into that. And in particular, like I think one community that we were thinking about in terms of like direct algorithmic harms or people exploring gender identity, sexuality, et cetera, being aggressively pushed gendered or you know heteronormative content because algorithmic, you know, their prior algorithmic history assumes you are of a particular gender identity, right? Nobody wakes up one day and is like, actually, you know what? I've decided on the opposite gender today. These are like long journeys of exploration and discovery. And for a lot of people, it's, there's a lot of shame involved and fear and having an algorithmic system being another part of that shame and fear is not particularly nice. Um, but again, yeah, I, so I don't know if that was your question, but that is something I have actually thought about. And I don't know what, because fundamentally built into the algorithmic system is that core assumption, right? Yeah. I'd love to build on that because this is a passion of mine. I'm a data scientist. And I think that society now is, are in these silos that we create ourselves. So the algorithms that are a part of our Twitter account, our um, social media accounts are feeding us the same information that um, confirms our biases. But how do you enter new and um, new information and even new science and, and opinions into that responsibly. So the paper that we wrote, so <coughs> to remove the problem of what you're talking about from, um, I would say like societal ethical implications, it's sort of been an issue of recommender systems for a long time. Like Netflix struggled with this and not in terms of like ethical implications, but just giving people fresh content. How do you figure out what kind of fresh content? We've actually, depending on how long you've had Netflix, have watched the company struggle with this. So you remember like there was a time where they, like occasionally in your feed, you'd get some like completely random thing. Mm -hmm. So what they were, what they were, <coughs> great example of things that work in a lab and not in real life. So in a lab environment, what you say is you introduce jitter, right? So throw in some noise, like, yay, now you have diversity because in expectation, your like median is shifted. But that reads kind of more like you love romantic comedies and suddenly give you Predator. And you're like, why would I watch the Predator? Um, but, then, but then what they realized is like it needed to be, um, so if you were to do like a conceptual mapping of let's say all the movies at Netflix, what it should recommend to you is like something that is slightly different, but not too different. So it can't go from, from like romantic comedy to Predator. It can go from like romantic comedy, like French art house film, because like maybe there's a love story and you'd be kind of interested in it. And now you're going to watch like this other, other different genre because you got pulled into it through a thing you like. So a little bit harder to do, but more related to how human beings think. And so do you sort of bring in what you're talking about, which is like, how do we introduce new ideas to people? Okay. 
as soon as my political science brain kicking in. You kind of can't. So all the research shows that people just don't change their minds. This is really depressing, right? So like most of the ideologies that we have built, like people don't generally change their minds, right? That doesn't mean we should be trying. It doesn't mean we shouldn't educate people. But it should be that our core expectation should not be that suddenly someone who thinks that all immigrants should be kicked out of the country will like be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to host a Mexican exchange student. Like, it's like highly unlikely for that. <laughs> However, we don't want that person then like storming the Capitol, right? So on one end, we get those people storming the Capitol, you know, not great. Um, so I think, you know, one thing is appealing to, one thing that does work though, is appealing to nodes of authority that they respect. Um, so it's not about Facebook or Twitter introducing new educational content to them because Again, predating social media, people have like confirmation bias. You can show them the most vetted scientific study that counters their opinion, and they'll be like, this is garbage. And like you could show them a terrible photoshopped image of the earth being flat, and they'll like see it right, you know. It doesn't matter. Like misinformation is not a function of quality, it's a function of belief. Um, but what would happen is if like suddenly Tucker Carlson said, I really love Mexico and all Mexican immigrants who come to this country, that would mean a lot more to them. So there is this interesting human aspect to it that has more to do with who they respect and whose opinions they learn from. Um, and that's a whole other conversation about how that how authority is structured very differently across different political perspectives, but I won't bore you with that. Hi, uh, I'm very curious to get your take on something because I feel like you have experience in different styles of auditing. So um, from your talk, I feel like I, I heard four different styles of auditing. There's like the internal auditing, at like for example, like the meta team at Twitter, and then you have external auditors, like third party companies that are fully focused or like organizations that are fully focused on external auditing. And then these like citizen data scientists who are like independent individual auditors, and then also like policy auditing. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, what you think some of the pros and cons are of those different approaches and what you think is maybe the most promising path forward. Oh, great question. I, should, I, I also even add another one, which would be automated auditing, right? Yeah. So even internally at a company, my team was hybrid applied research and engineering. So we have researchers. Who would, so most of the stuff you saw publicly, like the audits I talked about, those were like the three to six month deep dives from members of our team, et cetera. The other thing we were working on, why I had an entire engineering team as well, is we were trying to create the internal audit infrastructure to automate some of the stuff. Because if, if we want to, like we can't spend six months auditing one algorithmic system if Twitter has like a hundred algorithms with you right now. But let's just say like you know, 30 or 40, we're just, we're never going to be done. You know, it would take us years. So some part of that has to be automated. So I'd add that to it too. Um, there is no one promising one. I think each comes to totally different goal, right? So automated auditing systems are really great first line of defense. You know, we should have clearly defined metrics um, that we should be able to track for all of our models. Um, so the one that we had made on my team is actually an inequality metric. We published a paper about it. Um, it's not inequality probably the way you're thinking. It's inequality more defined like a Gini coefficient, um, which is based on how a model performs for the top 1% versus the bottom 99% um, on Twitter, which is really fascinating. Um, you know, so like creating the right metrics, tracking models across metrics. That's like a really good first line of defense, right? Um, a second line of defense would be the internal teams, you know, the proactive auditing of our models and like testing. So we were creating internal notebooks, like, you know, the, like the usual, all the fairness stuff we made into notebooks and we're providing a service. Then also there's the like deep dive audit. So like that's all that. So they all accomplish totally different things. External auditors provide a completely different perspective. We already have it, right? So people already do like soft puppet audits all the time. So independent of like the law. And like I said, like this is the stuff that hasn't been legally mandated, but it's great that, you know, it will be, uh, people will be able to have this access. Um, so external auditors accomplish a totally different goal, and they tend to look at at scale, like system level impact versus a model level impact. 
And then policy is like a totally different thing because policy will always come from a perspective of what is the existing law trying to protect and what is compliance at a minimum, right? And like, not to say compliance is ambitious, it is, but like ethics is kind of meant to go a little bit above and beyond compliance. So um, defining it as like, you know, we're talking about the Online Services Act in the UK and saying, okay, well, you have to protect children because children are protected class, right? And that's, that's really interesting, but also totally perspective from what my team would look at. We, would, we wouldn't have actually been like, oh, how does this perform for children? We would go maybe in a different direction. Um, yeah, so I think the things that change are the level of access, the level of like uh, subject matter knowledge about the system being analyzed, the tools that are being used, and kind of ultimately what purpose is it used for? Is it used to improve the product? Is it used to like shape the company? Is it used to like, I don't know, fix something about a system? Um, totally different, but all very useful. Thank you so much. The talk was so fascinating. Um, so I'm interested, I guess, in the, uh, the inverse of the interdisciplinary problem that we're talking about within compliance of having these teams where the person in control is a policy person or a legal person, and then the data scientist is like sitting there and hearing them say this God will be good about policy. Um, and I think the way that this is potentially of interest to you as a problem goes to the, the, the struggle you mentioned, for example, like human rights impact assessments, the struggle around auditing for things that are really hard to quantify that are actually contested policy concepts. So when I think of human rights or I think of legal standards around human rights, I think of lots of arguments <laughs> and those two things don't lend themselves to numbers. So I'm curious about the extent to which the algorithmic auditing community on the data scientist side of things has been thinking about how to engage with both policy experts, legal experts and impacted stakeholders as you're trying to define what is this fuzzy concept we're actually trying to test for. Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm deeply interested in this for a couple of reasons. So number one, like everybody in the responsible AI technical community got really, really excited when like they first discovered like Grace versus Stu Power Company. So it gave us a number, but like, oh, four fifths. And like, like, oh my God, like everyone got super excited because now we had a number and I completely ignored like the other aspects of it. So like, yes, there are blind spots in the technical audit community where somebody gives us a number, we get really excited. We tend to kind of ignore what you're saying, like the context of things. Interestingly, what we're seeing in a lot of the bills, right, and I'm gonna to refer to Online Safety Act again, is they have like a proportionality clause, which is very fascinating, right? Which is, you know, um, both the, if you are justifying your use of algorithmic system, it has to be proportional to the value you're extracting and balanced with like what the cost is to people for doing it. So like if they're like introducing some of this language back in, which is really great, um, but also to talk about, to, to mention what you're talking about with audits, uh, I was in, like, I think it was the Chatham House World of Things, I can talk about this. It was, um, it was like a mini, it was a discussion, it was like a panel discussion with the DSA folks and potential auditors organized by this group called AWO, uh, which is based out of Brussels, they're a really, really great organization. And it was like me and like all like the stuff suits from the big four and everybody played hot potato for a while for who had to define what the metrics were. And it was like, it like I had like this whole like Mr. Smith was Washington moment, it was wild. Cause they're like, oh, well, okay. Cause at one point it landed, landed with like, oh, well maybe the company should define what the metrics are. And I'm like, no, why are we here? That? Like, what are we doing? And to be fair, all the auditors were saying, with like, so everybody had, everyone was correct, right? The auditors were like, well, we're, we lose our objectivity as an auditor if we're defining what these metrics are for these terms. We just need to be hands in a sheet and we have to go exercise on the sheet, right? And the DSA folks are like, well, we can't define it. I didn't really understand their reason. But they're like, well, we can't define it because reasons. So everyone's <laughs> like, it was like wild. And this is actually specifically about how do we define metrics around things like human rights, et cetera. Um, so the answer is nobody knows. And so that's fun. Um, because when, like, when do we have to start auditing? Like this year. 
Is one of you start auditing? So that's not 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 resolved. <laughs> I'm sure you're you're very thrilled to know this. <laughs> I really want to thank you for the depth of your knowledge in what you're doing in uh, ethical AI, but also your care. And it really shows up, and I hope that's modeled for many others that follow in your footsteps. Um, my question is really about sort of what's happening today in a slightly different area, because you're dealing with the data and all the underlying pieces, which are essential. It has to be done right. But we seem to have an intersection happening that I'm curious in your thoughts about. So after the three years that we recently had with COVID and everything, 90% uh, of Americans believe that we're in a mental health crisis. And uh, I think most everyone does agree with that. And we've seen billions being dropped into mental health applications. Most of them are taking arcane old ways of looking at it and trying to put CBT and so forth inside some sort of application, which is very clunky and difficult and, and not profoundly effective. In fact, there's very little effectiveness as we look at it. Generative AI seems to have just instantly blown that, that game apart because now we can make, if we wanted to, a mental health app that looked very smart, caring, and so forth, and would give you horrendously bad, if not outright dangerous uh, advice. But I see no one talking about the ethics or how you would even start to address that kind of issue when it's going to have a profound effect very, very rapidly. And I thought you might have some interesting insights. Yeah, well, thank you. And also, so that interestingly came up in a Twitter thread where this one mental health app company uh, essentially did an A-B test very unethically on the people on their platform and gave a number of them a chat GPT therapist a number of them regular therapists. I think the, the most interesting takeaway besides the like deep unethical aspect of doing that for people who actually have mental health issues is the fact that once people realized that it was um, an algorithmic system they were talking to, they felt very, very betrayed. So fundamentally, I don't know if as human beings, we're okay with talking to a machine about our problems. It makes us feel used, it makes us feel lied to. And that's actually the number one thing people said is, oh, I was lied to. So I find that very, very interesting. And because I do agree there is a mental health crisis in this country, in, in this country. Um, for, and different demographics experience it very, very differently. And we haven't actually addressed the problem at scale. Maybe hopefully some of the billions of dollars that go into building the mental health apps can instead go into things like education, providing mental health services, giving people better incomes, you know, I kind of wish that instead of dumping all of hopes, all of our hopes and dreams on technologies that don't actually improve people's lives, that there was some way that they could actually be channeled towards the things that are proven to. So yeah, I mean, there hasn't, there hasn't been sufficient discussion. You're absolutely correct. We're already seeing people using generative AI in these ways. And the biggest way that it's failed is that people just don't want to talk to a machine learning model or an AI model. Uh, so earlier you were talking about uh, you mentioned that PETs are still somewhat in the R&D phase. Um, so I'm just curious, what are kind of like the technologies or ideas that are being thrown around to figure out you know how to actually go about implementing them? Yeah, so I have this like list of questions. I went through kind of quickly, but essentially there are certain milestones that we're trying to meet, right? So as I mentioned, PETs kind of work in a lab setting. What we need to do is sort of throw them against real world environments. So um, I can remember what was off the top of my head. The first one was like, does it operate at a massive scale of data? So that was the problem we were tackling with the Twitter challenge, where we wanted to test it against a billion lines of data, and then that worked, which is great. The second was like, does it hold up against um, security attacks, right? Because again, people build these things in the lab. They're all, they're not actually malicious actors trying to do malicious things. So, you know, maybe hosting some sort of like a capture flag event to kind of smash against it and see if people can extract information. The third was, does it work on complex queries? So it's one thing to be like, you know, give me the, the average of these 10 people. It's a whole other thing to say, perform this highly complex machine learning function. Like how complex can your query get? 
The second the one after that is how complex can your data get, right? So um, and there's a project that I hope we might be working on with a video platform to start analyzing their video content for, radical, for their video feeds for radical, radicalizing content. Um, but again, like video data is much more complex than text data, or numerical data, or like struct, whether it's structured or unstructured. Um, off the top of my head, I think those were the big ones we're trying to tackle. Um, but yeah, there are specific milestones that we do that we actually have in mind and we want to construct um, different projects around. And really the big thing is like we just need partners that have like corporate partners that actually have that kind of data would be willing to do that kind of challenge. We have time for one more question. I don't mean to hog the mic. So if somebody else has one, I'm happy to pass it over. Um, but I, I do have a follow-up question. I love your question. Um, this is something I think about all the time. I, I research mental health applications. Um, and uh, and I've tweeted a whole bunch in my career, but the only tweet that's ever gotten any attention from journalists <laughs> um, was a tweet where I was um, messing with Wobot, which for anybody, it does cut, it basically does cognitive behavioral therapy, um, but it has these very automated standard, you know, you try to talk to it and it just like kind of forces you into a certain form of dialogue with it. And um, I entered some queries that were related to suicidal ideation. And one of them was involving climbing up a cliff and jumping off of it. So that it was the response from the Wobot was, um, oh, it's so great that you're taking care of your mental and your physical health. <laughs> Go you, you know, um, and I was like, "Holy crap! Like this is this should not happen, right?" So I've used that. I took a screenshot of it and have used it in job talks and things like that. But um, I stream, I tweeted this out, and a journalist gets in touch with me you know, to talk about this. And um, I'm just one of, one of the papers that I worked on was looking at um, how can we use algorithms not to like replace therapists, but actually help educate people how to communicate with each other. Like what are the right strategies if somebody has this kind of a query or this kind of a negative thought then how do we encourage others to talk to them so that they can get a more effective response and so that's this this question is going to a place of like what what do you view as the role of algorithms right how should we be using them right because we can use them to replace the therapist and that's the easy, fast way to do things, but we could also use them to actually just kind of nudge people in the right direction in ways that are research, you know, evidenced, you know, right? So um, that's, a, that's, that's specifically in the context of mental health because that's what I know most about. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that, um, either in health or just on a larger scale. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty, like the future of work question has been a pretty fundamental question since, like day one, it's really interesting having been in the field of responsible AI for like almost six years at this point. That was the first conversation, right? Future of work and all the panels I was on back in like 2016, 2017 were all about like, oh, we're going to automate factory jobs and we're going to get so much more free time for like blah, blah, or whatever it was we were supposed to get. Um, and like, and like never in the history of like technology has that ever happened, right? We just all work more for some reason. Um, but no, you're asking very, especially like with generative AI, it's coming up a lot. Um, and for some reason, everyone's like hyper focused on lawyers. I don't know why everyone seems to think like lawyers are going to be all automated out of the job because Chat GPT exists, and that's the same as law, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> clearly. Uh, but the interesting things that we have already seen, even not Chat GPT, are the way some of these risk assessments have been used, let's say, inform decision making for judges. So like one is, you know, uh, a likelihood to um, likelihood to not show up for trial on whether or not judges should, um, you know, give people bail or not. And there's been some interesting work on like how people react to being provided that input. Um, there's other interesting research on, so just like TLDR is like, judges initially kind of listened to it, but ultimately like regressed to their mean. So like if they're not mandated to, they're not, but there's another really interesting study with like luggage sorters. And yeah, so compare, so the end, the end result was pretty much without boring any details of the study is that whether or not you listen to the machine learning model is a function of how much in authority you think you are in the environment you are in. So for a judge, like this is my courtroom, I decide what happens. 
agencies here. If this thing is telling me something, I will agree with it as long as I think it's correct. But for a language sorter who is not in a position of authority in the position they're in, they will just do what the machine learning model says. So literally it's like luggage would come out and the light would like turn green and you have to put the luggage on that conveyor belt. And it, it presumably would like do it in a way where we're not gonna get a jam, but you know, they would purposely screw with the algorithm, but over like every single time, even if, if it, even if it didn't make rational sense, to put the suitcase on that, they would just do it. Because they're like, well, if I don't do it, and something screws up, it's going to be my fault. And if, at least if it screws up, I'll be like the machine help me to do so, right? Because I am not in a position of authority in this environment. So I think there's a lot, like, oh, I don't, like, I don't specifically do HCI, like, by training. A lot of really brilliant people do. I think it's really time for those people to shine because there's so much really fascinating work to be done about people's professions, how they relate to technology, how they may be augmented by technology, but also like as it relates to that individual in the context of the environment that they are in and how AI models will change that relationship, maybe for better or for worse. I, I think it's just gonna be very, very interesting because you're right. I think the model we will net on is some sort of like augmentation rather than a pure replacement. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, so that brings us to the end of our programming. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and let's give our guests a round of applause.